today's video, we are going to discuss the ethics of medicine, including a controversial topic which led to a legal fight. What are medical ethics? Medical ethics describes the moral principles which a doctor is expected to obey and abide by. The core of healthcare ethics is our sense of right and wrong, as well as our beliefs about the rights we possess and responsibilities we owe others. In the UK and US healthcare systems, there are four pillars of ethics which define the duties that healthcare professionals owe to patients. These are autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. Autonomy is the responsibility of a doctor to honour a competent patient's right to make informed decisions about their own medical care. And the principle underlines the requirement to seek the consent or informed agreement of the patient before any investigation or treatment takes place. The principle is perhaps most relevant when patients exercise their autonomy by refusing life-sustaining treatment. However, as per the law, and as we mentioned, Briefly, an adult patient who suffers from no mental incapacity has an absolute right to choose whether to consent to medical treatment. This law also mentions that this right of choice is not limited to decisions which others might regard as sensible. It exists notwithstanding that the reasons for making the choice are rational, irrational, unknown, or even non-existent. From this statement of law, Initially implemented by Lord Donaldson, we can infer two things. First and foremost, this principle is only applicable to patients who have the relevant internal capabilities for self-government, assuming that they are free from external constraints. In other words, a decision is regarded as autonomous if the individual has the capacity to make the relevant decision has sufficient information to make the decision and does so voluntarily. If a patient satisfies these conditions, the doctor will be able to support the decision made by the individual, regardless of their own opinion. The doctor will be able to express their viewpoints and suggestions, but at the end of the day, it is the patient's verdict that stands. However, if a patient is seen to lack the capacity to make their own decision, healthcare decisions are ordinarily made by the healthcare professional in overall charge of their care, although adults can appoint someone to make decisions on their behalf. These decisions are closely regulated by law. Similarly, if a doctor feels as though the patient is being coerced into making a decision, then they have the right to disrespect the decision on the basis that it is not in the best interest of the patient. Although this may be hard to detect, coercion generally tends to occur in certain instances such as pregnancy. For example, a young woman may be under pressure by a partner to proceed with a termination of pregnancy. And so if a doctor senses this, good practice will involve spending some time alone with the patient in order to confirm that the decision is genuinely hers. Next, we have beneficence. In short, Beneficence is the doctor's duty to promote the course of action that they believe is in the best interest of the patient. It is often simplified to mean that practitioners must do good for their patients. But healthcare professionals believe that it's better to adopt a more holistic approach, more commonly known as patient-centric care, which generally involves ranking the available options for the patient from best to worst. In doing so, they should consider the following aspects. Will this option resolve this patient's medical problem? Is it proportionate to the scale of the medical problem? Is this option compatible with this patient's individual circumstances? And is this option and its outcomes in line with the patient's expectations of treatment? When ranking treatments, it is crucial 
to bear the patient's expectations in mind. After all, when doing good, this doesn't just refer to what's medically good for the patient, but also what is acceptable to the person being treated. Therefore, beneficence is important as it ensures that the healthcare professionals consider individual circumstances and remember that what is good for one patient may not necessarily be great for another. Now we will consider non-maleficence. It is often regarded as an inseparable pillar of ethics and assists to beneficence. Non-maleficence states that a medical practitioner has a duty to do no harm or allow harm to be caused to a patient through neglect. As a result, for a doctor to obey beneficence, they should inevitably express non-maleficence first. However, there are two major differences between the two. So what's the difference between non-maleficence and beneficence? Non-maleficence acts as a barrier for certain treatments. As we previously mentioned with beneficence, all valid treatment options are considered before being ranked in order of preference. However, with non-maleficence, not all treatments will be considered. This is because doctors will be aware that some treatments may cause more harm than good. And so according to the principle of non-maleficence, these should be ignored. The second difference is to do with the use of non-maleficence and how this contrasts with beneficence. The former is constant in clinical practice as it is a moral duty to provide medical attention to prevent the worsening of an injury, for example. Whereas beneficence is generally used in response to a specific situation, such as determining the best treatment for a patient. And finally, we have justice. In the context of medical ethics, justice is the principle that when weighing up whether something is ethical or not, healthcare professionals have to determine whether it is compatible with the law, the patient's rights, and above all, if it is fair and balanced. Doctors are specially expected to adopt the principle of justice as part of their duties to ensure that no individual is unfairly disadvantaged when it comes to access to healthcare. For example, some of you may know that the NHS has certain entitlements, such as free prescriptions for lower income individuals. This has been implemented on the basis of justice and ensures that there is little inequality in society due to differences in incomes. Now we will be looking at a case study involving a young boy named Charlie Gard was born on 4th of August 2016 with an exceptionally rare genetic condition called encephalomyopathic mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome or MDDS in short. Despite appearing perfectly healthy at first, his health soon began to deteriorate and soon developed severe brain damage in addition to being unable to open his eyes or move his arms or legs. This condition meant that he required the support of a ventilator which would aid his breathing. His parents, Bonnie Yates and Chris Gard, were trying to have an experimental treatment called nucleoside bypass therapy, MBT. But this has not been performed before, neither on animal nor human, with Chinese condition, RRM2B deficiency. Instead, the treatment had been previously offered to patients with PK2 deficiency, a similar genetic disorder. And so, Great Ormond Street Hospital applied for ethical permission to attempt nucleoside therapy on Charlie on the basis of beneficence. However, the High Court ruled out this option since Charlie's condition had been worsening and doctors soon came to the conclusion that Charlie's life support should be switched off and that he should be allowed to die with dignity. This had sparked a public outcry and the case went from the High Court to the Supreme Court to even the European Court. However, they all agreed with the decision of the doctors at the GOSH. 
before the involvement of the former US President Donald Trump and the Pope ensured Charlie's case became world news. Therefore, we would like to revive this debate. Was it right for Charlie God to be denied treatment? I for one believe that Charlie God should have been denied treatment and that this was the correct procedure to be made by the doctors at Great Ormond Street Hospital. My reason refers to the pillar of ethics known as non-maleficence. This treatment was very new and experimental. Therefore, the treatment could have done more harm than good to an already dying child. And this risk was too great to be taken by the doctors on a young life. Even though your point does make sense, I believe Charlie Gard should have been given the treatment. The reason being is that Charlie Gard at the time was a baby. Therefore, um, his medical decisions should have been taken by his um, guardians, which were his parents. And at the time, his parents decided that Charlie Gard should have this new experimental treatment. And I believe that their decisions for Charlie Gard should be respected. And it should be and it needs to be respected for their rights to be kept to respect the autonomy of the patient. For Rohan, I fully appreciate the point you made about autonomy. On the topic of autonomy, there is something known as the 1989 Children's Act. This Children's Act means that, for example, say if, if one of the parents was Jehovah's Witness, and therefore refuse blood transfusion for the child. The doctors can oppose the decision made by parents if they believe it's not for the best of the child. Therefore, doctors do have the right to oppose the decision made by parents if they believe it's not good for the child's well-being. And this should have been taken into account for this case. That's a good point. But Harley Gard's condition had already been worsening to a great extent so much so that he had an extremely low chance for survival. Therefore, surely it would have been more non-maleficent to carry out the experimental treatment rather than letting his condition worsen, leading to his death anyway. Thank you for listening to our debate. And if you have any more opinions on the case of Charlie Gard, do share them in the comment section down below. Many were divided by Charlie's plight. Some thought Charlie should be allowed to die with dignity, whilst others argued that Charlie's parents should be allowed to decide where and how he is treated. Regardless of how heartbreaking the verdict had turned out to be, we must remember that doctors made this informed decision based on autonomy and non-maleficence, as that this should be respected too. With this in mind, we will like to leave you with the following quote from Mr. Abhijit Nasker, one of the world's most celebrated neuroscientists. A doctor should be a clown at heart, a scientist at brain, and a mother at consciousness. Thank you for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe as we'll be posting even more videos in the future. We also have an Instagram and Twitter page, so make sure to follow them as well, as we'll be posting more content there on the future as well. You can find their links down below in the description. Thank you.